There we go. Um, so everybody, uh, welcome and thank you for supporting Los Angeles Birders. We are an all volunteer organization and your membership helps support all the great things that we do like these webinars, community science projects, field trips, pelagics, um, uh, lab S, lab uh, for students and all kinds of other great things. So tonight, we have Dave Bell, who's going to be talking about attracting hummingbirds to your yard, and he has a lot of hummingbirds in his yard. So, so this is this is going to be uh, a, a, a how-to, and also going to amaze you with how many hummingbirds there actually are. But I'm going to introduce Lily, who's now uh, who's a, a proud Lab S uh, member and a fantastic artist who's been a member of Lab S and also leads Lab S trips for a, a while. And and Lily is going to uh, introduce Dave. Yes, thank you very much, Mark. So with that said, Los Angeles Buddhist is very pleased to host Dr. David Bell tonight. Growing up in Southern California. Dave spent a lot of his time volunteering with nature-related activities, but his career took him on a path where he focused on engineering and business. Dave earned his undergraduate degree in physics from Harvard University, his master's from Columbia University, and his PhD from the University of Michigan. During his career, Dave has spent much of his efforts devoted to improving the environment. And he has also led or supported the development of apps for birders, including eBird Mobile, Merlin, and Birdseye, as well as several field guide apps. Today, Dave is the CEO and president of the Birdseye app, the CEO of Grand Care Health Services, and serves on the board of Los Angeles Birders. Dave is also host to a thriving community of hummingbirds at his home, and tonight, we have the privilege of learning about Dave's insights on the art of attracting hummingbirds. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. David Bell. Uh, thank you, Lily, I appreciate it. And here, let me <clears throat> see if I can figure out the sharing again, briefly here. And then a little trick here to make this stuff go away. There we go. Okay, uh, can you all see that? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm not gonna actually show a bunch of photos of birds in my yard, but um, but this is uh, a one photo. So I'll start with this just to give a sense for, um, you know, I have a lot of hummingbirds at times, you know, it goes up and down depending on the seasons, but um, <clears throat> attracting hummingbirds is something that I really enjoy and uh, something that I've done a lot of, um, I, you know, the number of feeders in my yard varies between like four and eight, but you know, you can, you can imagine that on a day like the one and the shown in this photo, if there were eight feeders up, that's a lot of birds um, at one time, right? And many more than that, just kind of hanging around the yard, uh, freeloading. So uh, let me, uh, let me dive in. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is um, provide just some practical thoughts on how to attract hummingbirds to your yard. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of people say, yeah, I put up a feeder in my yard, but all I've got is one male allens who drives off all the, all the other birds. Um, and uh, I've had that problem myself, uh, but I'm gonna talk, tell you a little bit about the things that I do and hopefully some of those will uh, be helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna try to make this very uh, practical in terms of, you know, Hopefully you can watch this and have a pretty good idea of what to do and what not to do to uh, successfully attract birds to your yard. All right, so um, <clears throat> to attract birds, hummingbirds in particular, you've got to kind of understand a little bit about their biology and some of their biology is different than what you might expect and it's different than a lot of other birds. And this uh, has a, uh, has consequences, it has uh, implications for how you attract them. So let me just talk about that. So first of all, they have the highest metabolism of any one warm-blooded animal, and they require large quantities of high sugar food. So, you know, they eat nectar primarily from flowers to get uh, the sugar they need to uh, maintain their high metabolisms. But of course, they can't just survive on sugar, they need other stuff. And so in addition to eating a, a bunch of nectar, drinking a bunch of nectar, 
they also uh, fly catch and catch insects. So they, they catch insects primarily by fly catching. So you'll see hummingbirds sitting on bushes and then darting out and catching bugs in the air. But they also do what's called hover gleaning, which is uh, a strategy for feeding that isn't super common in North American birds, but you know, ruby crown kinglets do it where they hover in front of a leaf and pick things off. And so by hover gleaning, which is different than let's say the way it Townsend's uh, warbler feeds by you know hopping along and picking things off the bush uh, off of a bush or bush tits. Um, hover gleaning allows you to you know kind of find things that other birds can't see or can't access. So um, so the key idea is they eat a lot of flying small flying insects and they eat a lot of nectar. So they need places where there's a lot of nectar and a lot of small flying insects. So it would probably you know if you're in a place where um, you know, there aren't a lot of trees or there aren't a lot of bushes. It's going to be harder to attract insects, uh, well, insects and therefore hummingbirds. So, um, you know, they need that that combination. But if you are in a place where there's a few trees, um, you know, in my yard, there's oak trees and that's where they seem to really find the bulk of the insects. Um, and you can provide nectar. You can have, you know, quite a few hummingbirds. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that um, studies have shown that hummingbirds spend about 70% of their time sitting around. They spend 20, 25% feeding, and then they spend 3% fighting, which um, isn't surprising. Um, okay, so hummingbirds employ several strategies uh, when they search for food, um, nectar in particular, um, because nectar, you know, tends to be sort of, you know, seasonal you know so like a, a, a plant will flower and there'll be a bunch of uh nectar and then two weeks later that one will be gone and there'll be another one somewhere else so hummingbirds have adapted themselves to uh a food food sources that kind of are are abundant for a short period of time but then they go away and then they're, they're replaced by something else someplace else so they they employ a strategy called trap line feeding where they go you know on every given day they They've learned there's, you know, seven nice groups of flowers in their neighborhood and they go to each one and they tend to do it kind of in a circuit and they repeat that over and over again. And then when when they visit a flower and there isn't any nectar there, then maybe the next time they skip that one. Or if it's super abundant and they, you know, have a lot of food there for a while, maybe they'll, you know, uh, spend more time there on following trips. So that's called trap line, where they go around in a group, in a path, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They also employ a territorial strategy, and this is what you see when you have a hummingbird. It's not always a male. Sometimes females do this, or immature males, but, um, you know, sitting and, like, driving all the birds off of a feeder. Um, so, you know, one thing to, about hummingbirds is that both nectar and insects are ephemeral um, food sources. And... They're, you know, they vary a lot by season. They vary a lot, like even just day to day, they vary with temperature. And so hummingbirds are really good at um, adapting from one food source to another food source and then going back. So, you know, I know one of the things that I hear people say is, you know, you shouldn't eat hummingbirds because if you do, then, you know, they'll get super attracted to your food and they won't be able to fend for themselves in the wild. But I, I personally don't think that that's accurate because I think that the birds that visit my yard in particular, you know, still have trap lines and still go visit other nearby uh, flowers. And in addition to that, um, you know, they're on their way to Alaska or whatever, and um, or back, and they, you know, they benefit from that that additional food source. But if it's gone tomorrow, that's no problem. They'll move on to the next thing. That's that's how hummingbirds are built. They do that. Um, so. Um, now it is, you don't want to disrupt them during the middle of the breeding season. So that's a little bit of a different thing. Um, so, uh, some other, you know, facts about hummingbirds is that they utilize, uh, this state called torpor. So they, they essentially can kind of hibernate and they, you know, they go into this state of torpor overnight where they reduce their metabolism by about, um, 15 times. So you know, much, much lower. Their body temperature drops, their heart rate drops, their breathing rate drops uh, dramatically. And this allows them to survive through the night because they would they would literally starve overnight if they uh, weren't able to do that. Um, so uh, ironically, hummingbirds can actually withstand surprisingly cold temperatures. I mean, 
They obviously can't survive in an environment where nectar is frozen, um, but they can survive in environments that, you know, if you keep, if you give them, you know, nectar, they'll survive in snowy conditions. Many, many of the species we have around here will survive in snowy conditions, no problem, as long as they have food sources. The problem is typically there's not a lot of nectar in insects when there's snow on the ground. So, but if you can give them nectar and, and, and uh, insects, they can withstand surprisingly low temperatures. Surprisingly, the thing they can't deal with very well at very high temperatures because they have this high metabolism, it's, it really is a problem for them. And so I'm going to show a photo later on on a hot day where there's a bunch of them just sitting in a puddle because, you know, it, it's, it can be fatal to them to have high temperatures. Um, some species migrate long distances, which is kind of amazing, like, you know, ruby third hummingbirds migrate across, across the Gulf of, Calif uh, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico. Um, and uh, they can fly quite fast, so up to, you know, 50 miles an hour or so in dives and uh, 35 miles an hour in kind of normal flight. So that's pretty good for a bird this big. All right. Um, okay, so yeah, here's a picture, as I mentioned, on a hot day of hummingbirds really just trying to survive. Um, one thing that's interesting, if you'll notice, is almost every bird in this photo is an adult male Allen's hummingbird. And uh, that's uh, you know one, something that is funny about hummingbirds is that they tend to do a lot of sexual selection where the migrate the males migrate at one time and possibly on a different route than the females and and the females and immatures would take a different um, route and potentially timing. So um, so yeah, so one thing to pay pay attention to when you're like watching a lot of hummingbirds is you'll see like you know for a month it's like all males and then suddenly it's all females. It's kind of kind of interesting. Um, okay, so one of the things that I'm going to do throughout the uh, throughout this presentation is I'm highlighting things in either green or red. And green are things that are like things that you should try to do. So these are things to you know help you be more successful in attracting hummingbirds to your yard. Red items are things to avoid. So um, hopefully that's kind of obvious, but uh, you know that. It will hopefully draw your eye to the most important things. So, um, so the fact that hummingbirds employ a trap line strategy um, in their feeding has important implications for feeding hummingbirds. So, hummingbirds will repeatedly visit a series of flowers and then kind of you know roughly repeat that pattern over and over throughout the day. And um, for you know, for anyone who's a birder who has spent time, you know, sitting in someone's backyard waiting for a rare hummingbird to show up, you know, kind of makes sense because a lot of times, you know, you'll sit there for an hour or two hours or, you know, 45 minutes and then suddenly the bird's there and it's there for, you know, two minutes and then it's gone again. And typically I think what's happening is they're going around and they're, you know, visiting all their other spots and then they come back again. And it gives you a sense for, you know, how many different sources of food a hummingbird will um, rely on. So, so this is important. Um, what they do is they're constantly updating and reprioritizing their, their trap line. So if they go to a food, a food source and it's, you know, there's nothing there, they'll skip it next time. If they go to a food source and there's a lot of food, they'll spend extra time there. If um, they find, uh, if they if they're flying along on the trap line and they see a bunch of hummingbirds going that way, they'll follow those hummingbirds and see where they're going because they're probably on some other trap line going to some other food source. So they'll add food sources by watching other hummingbirds. Um, so um, what what you know what this what this means is that hummingbirds have this incredibly specific spatial memory. I mean, and you'll see hummingbirds coming in at you know 25 30 miles an hour and they'll go. Whoop, they, and stop exactly right in front of a feeder. And if the feeder's not there, they'll stop exactly where the feeder should be um, because they have this spatial memory of where their next stop is on their trap line. So, um, you know, it's important to not kind of move your feeders around too much because they, they I mean, <laughs> literally like three feet away, is, you know, is too far and they won't, they don't find that. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> So one thing to think about here, you know, and how this, you know, what the implications of this are for uh, bird feeding is you need your, your mix, your nectar to be sweet enough that it kind of makes the cut. If you have nectar, which is not as sweet or not as abundant as, 
nectar at you know some other patch of flowers somewhere, you're not going to be on the trap line. <laughs> They're going to say, you know what, it's a waste of my time to go here because you're serving me 20% sugar and I can get 22% sugar from this uh, you know patch of sage you know up on the hill. So um, it's it's important. You've got to be. Uh, that's one of the criteria that hummingbirds use to prioritize different. Um, food sources on their trap lines. So that's uh, that's important. Um, you can never leave your feeders hanging, hanging empty. Um, what I like to do is hang feeders in, in clusters. And if they're within a you know foot or two of each other, if one's gone, they'll go to the other ones. But if you know the next feeder is like 10 feet away, they'll just like leave and say, I guess there was no food there. So it's um, it's important to not let your feeders go empty because then they'll just say, oh, I'm not stopping there next time. Um, yeah, and so the corollary of that is, you know, don't move your feeders around, like always in the same spots. Um, okay, so, so, you know, just mechanically, this is what I do and hopefully this is helpful. So um, when I'm making uh, my, my nectar for hummingbirds, I, I mix two cups of sugar with either six, seven or eight cups of water in it. It could be one cup of sugar with three, you know, but it's a three to one ratio, three and a half to four um, to one ratio that, that I use. Um, you know, kind of most of the books you see recommend a four to one ratio, but sometimes four to one isn't enough to attract hummingbirds, at least, you know, in this area. Um, so um, I, I personally, and I'll show this in a couple of slides, but I have a pre-marked picture that has a line for where the water goes and a line for where it should end up with sugar. And so that's really convenient. I can dump two cups of sugar in there and then just fill it up with water until it gets to the line and I don't have to measure a bunch of stuff. So that's just a kind of a simple little trick that will save you time. Um, then you can also kind of add the sugar and the water in whatever order you want because you know where you need to end up. Um, just use regular tap water. You don't need to boil the water. You don't need to do anything fancy. Just use tap water, mix it with it, stir it up until the sugar's dissolved, and you know, off you go. Um, I find that it can sit for 12 hours, you know, without a problem. I, I don't mix it in advance. I mix it when I need it. But if you know, I mix it and then I use it for one, it's fine to you know wait a few hours until another feeder is empty and then and then use it for the other one. However, something I've seen people do is like. Don't take the stuff out of your hummingbird feeder and dump it in with the other stuff to mix it or try to avoid saving or uh, wasting that additional nectar because what's happening is that the you, you know the the nectar that you're producing is is essentially you know the perfect environment in which to grow yeast and when yeast grows it produces alcohol and so the from the moment you make it the nectar is fermenting now hummingbirds are sort of uniquely evolved to be able to survive higher levels of alcohol than most other types of animals. But, um, but it doesn't take much alcohol to kill a hummingbird. Um, and humming, and once you get about past about a, a one and a half percent alcohol, hummingbirds, you know, don't like uh, drinking it. So, um, you know, the, the thing you want to think about is you got to always be serving your guests fresh uh, nectar that hasn't had a chance to ferment. One of the big things you can do is, you know, clean and sterilize your um, your feeder between feedings so that, you know, it's not starting out with a bunch of yeast that then, you know, accelerates that process. And, you know, kind of going back to the point I made earlier, the last thing on earth you want to do is take a bunch of partially fermented <laughs> nectar and pour it in with a bunch of fresh nectar because all you're doing is inoculating that nectar with a bunch of yeast and it'll, you know, explode. Um, and grow a lot of alcohol really fast. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, a, an important thing with feeders is you want to be able to clean it. So what I typically do is I take it apart and just like wash it under, you know, regular tap water with, uh, you know, warm tap water with my fingers just to get all the slimy stuff off. And about, you know, once every few days or every week, I, I sterilize it. So either I'll run it through the dishwasher or I'll pour, you know, hot water, like boiling water, onto it and let it sit for a few seconds to, to sterilize and then then I'll keep using it. I'll wash it with you know soap and water every once in a while. But but you know I might do that once a week. In between I'm just washing with my hands just enough to get it so it's not feeling slimy. Um, okay so uh, I've seen people do this where 
you know, there's like, okay, time to fill the hummingbird feeders. They go down, go outside, take out all the hummingbird feeders off, bring them inside, fill them all, you know, 15 minutes later, take them all back to outside and hang them up. You do not want to do that. <laughs> you want to fill one or maybe two at a time, depending on how many you've come up, because all those hummingbirds that are coming through your yard and trap lining, if they go there and there's no hummingbird feeder, and, and not just no hummingbird feeder anywhere, but no hummingbird feeder in the spot they're used to going to, they just won't come back, you know. Um, so you've, you've got to make sure you, you know, are taking down like one feeder at a time and then replacing it and taking down another one and replacing it. Um, you know, if you have like, say, two or three clusters of hummingbird feeders, you can, you know, fill one and then put that back and fill one and, and just so every trap lining hummingbird who comes through finds something to eat. <clears throat> All right, um, nectar. So, you know, every, you know, when I go on vacation for two weeks or something, the hummingbirds, you know, stop coming, of course. Um, and so then I have to build them back up. And so when I do that, I usually start with a sweeter mix, so like three to one. And then once they've kind of started coming back, then I'll switch back to three and a half or four. Um, you can kind of, you, I, I can kind of tell. I, I feel like if you know, I, I'm using four to one and then suddenly the hummingbird numbers drop, you know, maybe I'll switch back to three and a half because maybe something's blooming next door that, you know, competes with that. But um, I also tend to have slightly sweeter nectar during migration because during migration, the birds are eating just a tremendous amount and they need a lot of energy just to be able to continue uh, on their way. Um, it's amazing, but a, uh, a rufous hummingbird or a ruby throated hummingbird, which we don't have here, but you know, they're well studied, can eat 100% of their weight per day in sugar. <laughs> not, not counting all the water and stuff, but just, you know, they weigh, you know, three to six grams and they can eat three to six grams in sugar in a day, which is mind blowing, not counting the insects and everything else they eat. Um, so again, just to clarify, three to one means three cups of water plus one cup of sugar that works out to about a 29% sugar content by weight. Um, four to one is uh, four cups of water plus one cup of sugar is about 22% sugar content. So um, in the wild, flowers range from about three to 80% sugar content and the hummingbird favored flowers around here range from 20 to 25. So, um, you know, you, you gotta you gotta at least be in that range of the local flowers or else you know no hummingbird's gonna want to come to your yard so if you, you you know i would not go anything below four to one uh sugar content all right um i've done some experiments on how much sugar content seems to um, be favored by hummingbirds and, and surprisingly to me um you know there's been research that shows the higher the sugar content the more hummingbirds favor it and i I believe that it makes kind of evolutionary sense, but um, in my own experiments, the preference for sweeter nectar is pretty pretty slight. It's um, you know like the preferences based on the height of the feeder or the location of the feeder seem to be larger than the preferences based on the sweetness of the nectar. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is I think maybe Anna's prefer stronger nectar than Allen's. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't really have enough data to say for sure, but, but I can say for sure, based on, you know, my experiments, you would think that if you hung a feeder with three to one next to a feeder with four to one, that everybody would go to this one, but, but that really doesn't happen. Like all the birds seem to almost be evenly split between the two and the, the rate at which they drop is almost exactly the same. So it's, it's surprising, but it's true, at least in my case. Okay. Um, oh yeah, so here's uh, here's the kind of feeder. So I've got these. Um, it, it so, so happened that the little lines that were on this like worked out perfectly for where the feed needed to be. But you know you can buy a pitcher like this, draw lines, and you know save yourself from having to measure every single time. So you get a scoop, put like you know one cup of sugar or two cups of sugar, and then fill it up to the line, and you're done. Um, something I don't know where this comes from, but um, you want to give hummingbirds plain white sugar um brown sugar or gold sugar or blonde sugar or i mean god forbid like sugar substitutes are not good for hummingbirds they contain other stuff that is um basically like burnt residues from producing sugar 
that are poisonous to hummingbirds. So you, you want to use plain white sugar that has all that stuff processed out of it. Um, you want to clean the feeders when you fill them. You want to sterilize them weekly. Um, yeah, and one thing I didn't mention before is because fermentation happens, um, you know, when you're when you're starting to feed and you're saying, I want to attract hummingbirds to my yard, um, don't don't like fill up a feeder, you know, all the way to the top and then leave it out there for a week because what you'll end up with is, you know, 12% alcohol and no hummingbird will want to go to it. What you want to do instead is fill it up just a little bit and then the next day, dump it out, clean it out, fill it up again and, and give, give fresh, uh, clean uh, food every day. As you know, the hummingbirds consume more, you can fill it a little bit more and over time, you know, you can fill it all the way up to the top and you know, they'll eat it by the end of the day. All right, let's see. Hey, uh, Mark and uh, company, I can't see uh, the chat. So if there's questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and I'll, I'm happy to, uh, you know, answer them. Yep, um, absolutely. All right, so um, you know, I showed this because I think this is kind of funny. So this picture is like a picture from my orders on Amazon. <laughs> and, uh, so these are um, 50 pound bags of sugar. So you can see like, August 9th, August 30th, September 16th, October 6th, October 13th. Um, that gives you a sense for how many hummingbirds, how much sugar hummingbirds in my backyard. Um, so, um, some, I just, you know, talked about some of the things you, you should do when you're feeding hummingbirds here, some things you don't want to do. So don't use red food dye. Um, hummingbirds aren't attracted to the color of the nectar there. The red of the uh, feeder itself will attract them. You don't need to add food dye. Um, you don't need to boil the water. Don't use, you know, sugars that aren't plain white sugar, um, and don't let the nectar ferment. So I think we've covered all those things. All right. Um, I wanted to give a sense for placing the feeders. So um, I guess you know, there's no like super magic rule about this, but you know, people say you want the feeders to be at least about four feet off the ground because you don't want them to be um, close enough to the ground that there's a danger that cats will get at them. And, and hummingbirds, you know, kind of prefer to be a little bit higher off the ground. You want them to be a little bit away from the walls, um, depending on what your walls are made of. Rats will climb up the walls and jump onto the feeder. Um, for the same reason, you don't want them like right up under the roof. Hummingbirds get a little squirrely want, being right up under the roof. They prefer to be, you know, have a little space around them. Um, you want to put them in a place where they're not going to get too much direct sunlight. And I prefer to put them in clusters. Uh, so, you know, you can see down at the end, they're um, kind of, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in this area, there's a cluster of three. They're all, you know, a foot or two away from each other. Um, that works well because then when you're filling one, you know, the other two are still, um, you know, still have enough nectar. So strap lining birds will come in and, you know, it's close enough that they'll go to the other feeders. Um, but, you know, and then uh, don't move the feeders around too much. And you don't want to put them in places where uh, birds are sort of encouraged to fly through windows. So, you know, in my case, it's surprising. I've got a bunch of windows in my house and hummingbirds don't really hit them very much. Um, and when they do hit them, they just kind of bounce off and fly away. Um, I, you know, rarely have hummingbirds that die. But um, I have placed my feeders in locations in the past where it seemed much more dangerous. It, like if they could see the feeder from another angle, they would try to come from the other side of the house, you know, and and go through a window, and that they that was dangerous. So I've I've had to experiment to find places that um, don't seem dangerous. All right, um, I'm going to show you a quick video here just to give you a sense. And, and this is actually kind of what it's like in my yard sometimes uh, during migration, but I don't have a good video of that in my yard, so I'm showing a video from someone else's yard. But um, but really the point of this is to, you know, highlight how when you have fair numbers of hummingbirds, it's, it's pretty difficult to estimate the numbers. And so I was just going to talk uh, very briefly about that. So I'm going to play this video for just, well, no, I'm going to talk through the words because once I start playing the video, then the, the guy starts talking. And uh, so counting bird individual birds in a situation like this is kind of impractical. I mean, you can take photos, but even then, you know, it's it's a mess. Um, it's hard to know which individual birds are repeats. So, you know, as you're counting, they're all kind of moving all over and it's 
uh, very difficult to keep track of, you know, some of these goes and somebody comes back because it's the same bird, like it's hard to know. Um, so studies with st banded birds have indicated that um, birds, individual birds spend maybe five to 10% of their time at, at a feeder. I personally think that that's um, uh, an overcount and that I think that that's probably true for birds that are being territorial, but birds that are trap lining, I think it's more like one or 2%. Um, so, uh, you know, then like they've, I've heard people say, take the number of birds you see at your feeder and multiply it by six, or take the number of birds you see at your feeder and multiply it by 10. I don't think that method works when you're talking about trap lining birds. I think that works when you're talking about territorial birds. So I don't, I don't use that method. And I'll talk about um, the, what I do do here in a minute, but um, you know, and again, we've all seen situations where you want to look for a rare bird and you wait like two hours and then finally the bird shows up. So, you know, we know that hummingbirds spend a lot of time other places besides where the feeders are. All right, so I'm going to show you this video just to give a sense for what, you know, counting hummingbirds is like in the real world at busy feeders. So, um, you can get us, you can see that count, I'm trying to count those guys, let alone to keep track of how many Allens and how many Rufus and how many collections there are is, is a pretty tough activity. All right. Oh man, I did it in time before the guy started talking. All right. So, um, okay. So there's the solution and the way I, I try to deal with that, like when I'm making Niebuhr checklist or something is, um, there's various experts like Sherry Williamson is the one I, you know, respect the most have, um, come up with, uh, an approach, which is basically look at how much nectar you use in a day and then, um, multiply that by, about 500. So if you use one gal, if you, if your hummingbirds are, are drinking or eating about one gallon of nectar per day, then that means she says, you know, roughly 500, 550 hummingbirds are using your feeders. That's assuming that they aren't eating any food at all from other sources. That means that's assuming they're getting 100% of their nutrition from your feeders, but it also makes a bunch of other assumptions. So, um, you know, that's, that's about what I use depending on how you do the math, uh, you know, you can come up with numbers that are between, I mean, other experts have come up between three and 700. When I do the math, I can come up with anything between like 250 and like 1,250. So, um, you know, when they're migrating, they eat more food. So that would be fewer birds. If they're using other bir other sources of food, that would be more. So, you know, it's a very rough thing, but but I think that's that's probably the best way to try to estimate what's going on at your feeder. Um, I've got here a little bit of a you know deep dive into how that calculation works, um, which I won't go through right now. But um, you know you can uh, you can see that on the screen. Um, <clears throat> but you know I think somewhere you know with migrating birds maybe it's 300, and with um, you know uh, birds that are you know spending a lot of time in your feeders, it's more. So. For me personally, I've had up to uh, three, my birds eating about three gallons of food per day. So depending on how you calculate that, that's you know gonna be somewhere between like say 1,500 birds to maybe 3,000 birds utilizing my feeders. So that's, that's a lot of birds. Um, at any one given point in time, there might be you know, one or 200 present. Um, okay, feeders. Uh, <clears throat> so, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail here, but you can make your life easier or harder depending on what kind of feeder you choose. So I will uh, just quickly go through some of the things I've learned. I've I've actually tried or used um, something, either everything here or something very similar to it at some point or time. Um, all right, so this is a, a kind of an old standby. This is, uh, this is a really good feeder. Um, when you're looking at hummingbird feeders, there are several things to pay attention to. So one of the most important is the number of ports that are present. So this this one has six ports. That means six hummingbirds can eat at one time. Um, so you want, you know, obviously if you want a lot of hummingbirds or, you know, you want more than one hummingbird, you need to have enough ports that they can kind of feed on this side and feed at this side and not see each other and not get pissed and stuff. Um, and you, if you have a bunch of hummingbirds, you want enough that they can all sit around and have enough ports to share. So six is okay. It would be nice to have more. I, I didn't put it on the list here, but um, 
this feeder seems like um, uh, you know longer build species like Anna's do fine with it, but lower short build species like Calliope seem like they can't get their bills in there enough to get food out of it. So um, I, that that's a con that I forgot to mention. Anyway, so, um, this this is really good in terms of simple to clean, easy to take apart. It's microwavable, dishwasher safe, holds a quart of nectar, which is good. So. Um, it's easy to see how much nectar is left. Some of the other hummingbird feeders, it's really hard to see how much is left, which is a pain in the butt because then you got to keep going out and checking them all day instead of just looking through the window. Um, so th this is a good this is a good feeder. Um, some of the cons are that these yellow flower things are detachable and they grow gunk, and then you got to wash them, and you need a little pipe cleaner, and you got to put them in boiling water, and once you do that a few times, then eventually they break or you lose them, and then you end up with a hole that doesn't have a flower in it. <clears throat> it's big enough for a bee to get in, and so you know it's it's kind of a pain um, to be honest. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but um, the, the the that's really I'd say the primary um, negative of this one. Also, I like to sterilize them with boiling water, and I have had the black the glass um, containers break when I pour boiling water into them. So. That's that's a negative as well. Um, okay, but anyway, that's a good feeder. I would say that that's that's a good choice. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, another feeder. Um, the, it's attractive. It's a great gift for someone who is not interested in feeding hummingbirds, um, but wants something attractive to hang in their backyard. Um, it is hard to clean and it does not work. So that's uh, that's my review of this one. Um, <clears throat> Okay, these are like I see these at you know like the local garden center and stuff. They look like they'd be okay, but they only have four ports. Um, the ports are super complicated to clean. Um, <clears throat> they're not terrible. They've got a good quart capacity. The they're you know they've got this like sort of attractive slim waist on the glass bottle, but that just makes it hard to clean. You can't get you know a, a sponge down in there and I don't know this if you don't have anything else these are okay but they're not um not my favorites um these have these are good these have five ports they're very simple and easy to clean they're like you can completely sterilize them they're great um they're they're good if you're in an area where there aren't a ton of birds um like they're good kind of in the east coast where ruby throated hummingbirds aren't super you know dense um but they they have some negatives and <clears throat> i don't use them um they have a low capacity you can't you know you have to fill these things you know i would have to fill these things like 10 times a, a day or whatever um <clears throat> you know they can only hold a few ounces of liquid they require so they require frequent uh refilling it's impossible to see how much nectar is left you 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 can't like you have to walk up to it and look at it to see how much nectar is left so they're they're good but um they i, I don't use them um okay um, these are the ones that i have uh lately been using the most i i do like these um uh, <clears throat> so they have 10 ports which is great you can i mean and I'm, a lot of times you get 10 hummingbirds sitting around drinking and there's another 10 hummingbirds waiting for their turn so you know all those ports get used um it's only it's only made of i guess four pieces um so it's super easy to take apart clean there's no gunk there's no like little yellow flowers that you got to deal with um hummingbirds love it bees can't get in there yellow jackets can't get in there orioles don't like it as much as some of the others which which is good because orioles will land on your feeder and splash all the food all over the place um so so i like this one um my main complaint about this one and uh is is basically that the bottle is this really cheap back formed plastic stuff and so if you run it through a dishwasher it gets ruined if you it'll just like melt and deform if you pour boiling water into it it'll melt and deform um you can't put it in the microwave to sterilize it so you can put hot water in it but you have to like wash it around and then dump it out before the back form falls apart um but that's really the only flaw i mean it's a it's a really good feeder i, I like this one a lot um so that is my that is my first choice right there. Um, okay, the, again, these are look look cool. They're conversation pieces. They don't work at all. Um, they're impossible to clean. They don't attract hummingbirds. So I don't I don't know why these exist. They make me angry. Um, 
So, <clears throat> okay. And then uh, there's this guy. Uh, so it has just four ports. The red isn't where you're trying to make the birds go. The metal is hard to clean and can't be microwaved. The flowers don't come off. So basically, this is just a dumb hummingbird feeder. So just had to throw that out there. However, if you hang this hummingbird feeder in your backyard and you succeed in attracting a barrel line hummingbird to your backyard, like shown in the photo here, I will personally come to your house and apologize to you for um, calling it dumb. So, um, okay. <clears throat> just uh, recapping. I think I've already covered all this stuff, so I don't know if I really need to recap. But um, use multiple feeder spaced apart to avoid having a single bird drive off all the others. Um, if you are having that problem with one bird driving off all the others, take take two feeders and just kind of put them far enough away that one bird can can watch them both. Um, start with sweeter nectar, like three to one. That that'll make it worth other birds' time to come and fight with that one and kick them out. Um, don't let your feeders run dry even for a few minutes. Uh, don't serve fermented nectar to your hummingbirds, and don't forget to wash and sterilize your uh, feeders. All right. So. One of the things, I, there was an excellent seminar, a webinar uh, by Desi, a, uh, I don't know, was it six months ago, a year ago, um, on how to identify feeder, uh, the, the common hummingbirds in uh, Southern California. And that's, that's an excellent summary. So I'm not going to try to uh, cover any sort of identification here. But what I thought would be um, interesting here would be to go through all the rare hummingbirds that occur in Southern California. Um, and one of the things that's interesting, I think, for all the rare hummingbirds is almost all the rare hummingbirds with really just one, maybe two exceptions, is that they are really easy to identify. <laughs> um, they'd be very easy to detect and they'd be very easy to identify. They sound different, they look different, they're big or small. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to run through them really quickly because if you do have hummingbird feeders, um, particularly let's say if you had hummingbird feeders on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, I mean, it's only a matter of time until you see something really, really cool out there, um, or you know, Point Doom, or you know, really, you know, not, you know, Marina del Rey, or Long Beach, or you know, anywhere kind of close to the coast, or out in the desert. Um, so, I would encourage you to just basically familiarize yourself with you know what could show up, um, and. Fortunately, all the rare stuff that show up doesn't look like the six common species here. <laughs> so um, that's that's handy. Um, I'm going to run through these quickly. And all these birds have occurred, I think it's true, I think every single bird here, maybe with one exception, has either occurred in LA, LA County or one of the adjacent counties. I think there's one that's only been San Diego. Um, so here. So Mexican violet ear has uh, sh shown up once in um, uh, Ventura County on Mount Pinos, and it was, it's like a big, long-tailed, you know, bright green, beautiful, crazy-looking hummingbird, so you would notice that if it's that. It also sounds weird and is bigger than anything here, so, you know, that would stand out. Um, Rivoli's hummingbird is a common bird in southeastern Arizona, has occurred in uh, San Diego County, um, not in L.A., um, the, you're going to notice this thing because it's going to be twice as big as any other hummingbird, you know, you've ever seen in Southern California. So uh, it would stand out. Um, it also has a really distinctive sound um, to its wings and to its call. Um, Blue-throated mountain gem, which used to be called blue-throated hummingbird, is also large. I think it's even larger than Rivoli's hummingbird and uh, also, you know, would, would immediately stand out if one of those flew by in your backyard, you would know about it right away. Um, <clears throat> ruby throated hummingbird. This is the only one that's kind of a hard, well, it's a very hard identification. I mean, if you don't see an adult male. Um, so the females look almost exactly like black chinned hummingbirds, so they would be pretty hard to identify. The one thing that is helpful with these would be, you know, again, if you were in Palos Verdes Peninsula, black chinned hummingbirds almost all depart by mid September. These guys, you know, if you see a black chin type hummingbird after about mid September, um, you know, but especially in October or even early November, you want to take a very close look at it because, you know, it's probably a fairly, you know, it's not such a long shot that it could be one of these guys. Um, broad tailed hummingbird. Uh, this one looks somewhat like uh, Allen's or a Rufus, but the wings of the male sound completely different. The voice of the male and the female sound completely different. So, 
you'd probably, if you got tuned into what the birds in your backyard sounded like, you're like, I hear something different in the backyard. Um, Broadbilled hummingbird. There's like an invasion right now of broadbilled hummingbirds in Southern California, <clears throat> especially along the immediate coast. Um, they're probably going to be the only hummingbird in Southern California with a red bill. Um, so that would be the thing you would notice right away there. Um, obviously, the males look spectacular, but um, even the females have this kind of bright ear stripe and a red bill. Um, and and they also sound completely different than anything. They sound kind of like a ruby crack kinglet. Um, and then Xanthusis hummingbird, believe it or not, has occurred in Ventura County, which is, this is an endemic from, a sedentary endemic, no less, from the Cape District of Baja, California, but um, a spectacular bird, which has made it to Ventura. In fact, it's made it to Canada, even. Um, so, you know, sooner or later, one of those will probably wind up in Southern California again. And then last but not least, violet crowned hummingbird has been seen in LA County. Um, this is a spectacular bird. Again, it's bigger than any of our hummingbirds, brilliant white below, purple crown, red bill. So um, you would not be, you, you would immediately see that and think I've got something different on my theater. So, um, <clears throat> all right, well, let's see, 53 minutes. So hopefully um, we'll, get, we'll, uh, we'll get in under an hour here. Um, Mark, any, any comments or questions? Oh, well, thank you, Dave. This, is, this has been fantastic. Um, and we do have a whole list of questions in the, uh, in the Q&A, right. um, which, which, um, which I'm going to want to uh, read out loud as usual, because there are people in the, um, in the uh, 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 YouTube who don't actually see the questions. Um, so the, the first uh, question, you, you, did, you mentioned that you don't have to boil the sugar water solution, but the question is, if you do boil the sugar water solution, does that make it less attractive to the hummingbirds? Uh, I don't know because I don't do it. Um, so I think it's just a waste of time and energy personally, but um, I, you know, I know there are people who do recommend it and it's it's certainly a good way to get the um, liquid sterilized. I mean, but by the time you boil it, now you have to let it cool down because you can't put boiling water out. You'll just, you know, kill your hummingbirds. So um, I, I, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but it just it makes it a much, much longer process. Um, I think it's more important to, you know, just put out fresh food every day. Um, if you do that, um you know whether it was perfectly sterile or not when you started i think doesn't matter very much okay great thanks um another uh question from uh ivan uh, about the bathing pool for the hummingbirds if you can't provide a bubbling fresh water source but just clean water how shallow should the water be and how do you attract them to the to the bath yeah so um I've never been successful at attracting hummingbirds with water. I mean, you know, hummingbirds do kind of use the little water feature I've got in my backyard, but um, the people who I've seen who have been successful at attracting large numbers of hummingbirds all have basically kind of like, it's got to be moving water. I don't know why, but it seems like what, hummingbirds love like things that are spraying and things that are like dribbling. Um, <clears throat> and so it's got to have that sound of gurgling water and, it, and typically it's going to be water kind of running not too fast, you know, but it's flowing slowly over the time or moving on a, a, a thin layer, you know, with um, rock underneath it. They seem to like to sit with their belly in the water, um, like, like in that photo. Um, mm -hmm. All the places where I've seen, you know, numbers of hummingbirds, it's either been in kind of like a little sprinkler or a mister or in a water feature that has like water kind of moving on top of a, a thin layer of water on top of a rock. So when I say thin layer, you know, quarter inch, eighth of an inch, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, a question by uh, Ken, have you ever heard of Sapphire Labs Nectar Defender? Well, that sounds fancy. It supposedly extends the life of the nectar, which I believe ambient temperature is still a factor here in Central Valley summers? Yeah, um, I have not. Um, I mean, it, it makes sense that that would, that something like that would help. I, 
you know, I'd be a little nervous, you know, wanting to make sure that whatever it was, was not going to be dangerous to hummingbirds. Um, but, you know, to be honest, I don't, I don't worry about it because I never leave food out for more than 24 hours. And so, you know, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't think it's something that I, I need. I would prefer, and I would recommend, you know, put your food out for 24 hours and then replace it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Scott asks, uh, websites that urge us to clean feeders show photos of birds with deformed bills. Is there any evidence that pathogens acquired at feeders cause bill deformities? Um, I mean, yes, there's ample evidence of that. I, I'm not aware, though, of any evidence of that. You know, it could very well be the case, but I'm personally not aware of any evidence of that with hummingbirds. Um, I think... Um, you know, if a disease were to come through that affected hummingbirds, then, you know, certainly um, I would, I'd consider not uh, feeding. But the thing to bear in mind is that, uh, you know, by the way, by the nature of the way hummingbirds exist, you know, you know, a given flower is going to have a hundred hummingbirds visited during the course of a day. So, um you know, if that type of pathogen came along, I suspect that it would spread naturally, probably just about as well as it spread through feeders. But, you know, mm -hmm. still, you wouldn't want to contribute to that problem. Right, right, right. right. Okay. Um, uh, question from Carol. In my yard, the hummingbirds fly the mortar lines of the block wall and appear to be eating maybe spiders or ants. Is this a mm -hmm. common behavior? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was talking about at the very beginning of the presentation when I said hover gleaning. I mean, that is, that's hover gleaning is, you know, hovering and picking bugs or arachnids or whatever off of, um, you know, off of things. You know, uh, it's hard for most other birds to get there. So hummingbirds specialize in getting those bugs that other things can't get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, they do the same thing in my yard. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's cool behavior. Um, uh, another insect question. Yvonne asks, what's the largest insect you've ever seen a hummingbird or that you've known a hummingbird to eat? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I, uh, I cannot ever recall seeing a hummingbird eat a insect that was really large enough, frankly, for me to even see the insect. Um, I see them go grab stuff and swallow it, but I, uh, but I, I you know, it seems like mostly they're eating things that are the size of mosquitoes or gnats, I think. Mm -hmm. But I don't know the answer to the question. I, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm curious now to go look it up, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, Conley asked, uh, should feeders have a place for the birds to sit down to feed? Um, yeah, okay, great question. Um, <clears throat> so I didn't mention that at all with my feeder commentary, but I, I think the answer is yes. I think um again the you know the feeders that i recommended uh the birds all sit i mean there are, there are some birds that for whatever reason seem to like to hover but um almost all i'm going to say 99 out of, 99 out of 100 seem like they prefer to sit and eat and it makes sense it's you know it takes less energy to sit and eat um i know they're capable of flying but um you know they they could they could fly but they prefer to sit so i would choose feeders that allow them to sit yes um mm -hmm. one thing I'll, I'll i'll note though like for example on the the, the ones i showed that had the yellow flowers um you know i mentioned the calliope hummingbird seem like they can't get their bill in there uh they also aren't big enough to sit and reach their head up to get their bill over into the um flower and mm -hmm. they have to hover just to even be able to do that um whereas the ones i showed you, you know, costas and calliopes and all the local hummingbirds can comfortably sit and, and feed without having to fly. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, another another pro on there. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, so uh, someone asks, is putting a little bleach in the cleaning water bad for the hummingbirds? Um, it probably Just depends on what you mean by a little. Um, I mean, tap water has... Um, a little bit of chlorine in it, which, you know, is bleach, basically. Um, 
And I think that that's helpful. I specifically do not try to use bottled water or filtered water because I think, you know, I want a little bit of that chlorine in my, uh, in my water to slow down the propagation of the yeast. Um, but I've never experimented with adding more and I would, I'd be a little nervous with that, but you know, um, I mean, I think it, if you got exactly the right amount, it probably would be good, but I would be nervous about making a mistake and then hurting birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Do other bird species feed uh, by trap line uh, like warblers? Great question. Um, I don't know. I, I would assume that there are some other species like maybe sunbirds, um, for example. Um, I know there's some birds that specialize in, you know, feeding on bees' nests, for example, um, or other very, very specialized food. But I'm not aware of any uh, other bird species that, um, that employ trap line strategies. And, uh, you know, when I was preparing this talk, you know, I looked on Wikipedia and a few other places for information on trap lining, and I did not see any references to other birds, the other groups of birds that employ trap line strategies. So I would assume there probably are, but I guess they're not known yet. Mm -hmm. okay, like, yeah, for example, much. there's birds that um, specialize in eating mistletoe berries or, you know, certain like <clears throat> rare, not rare, but, you know, localized ephemeral food sources. And I would imagine that there probably are some undetected trap lining strategies, species out there that, mm -hmm. that we just haven't, you know, noticed that on yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, question from Yvonne, uh, with your multiple feeders, do you find that you have multiple nests as a result? My yard is completely full of nests of hummingbirds, yeah. Like, I, I mean, we probably have, I mean, probably every oak tree has 10 nests in it or something. I don't know. There, there's a lot of nesting in my yard. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, is So you talked about bees on the feeder. Is a bee capable of harming a hummingbird or is it just an annoyance at the feeder? Yeah, it's really more of an annoyance. Um, I mean, the, the bees will... Um, if, you know, one bee will bother the hummingbirds, like the hummingbirds will kind of fight with the bee, the bee will push the hummingbirds off the feeder, the hummingbirds will attack the bee and make it go, you know, and um, so it interferes, they, I mean, bees interfere with hummingbirds using the feeder. Um, if there's enough bees, the hummingbirds just won't use the feeder at all. Um, same with yellow jackets. Um, but but, you know, and, and obviously, you know, a, a big problem that a lot of people have, although for whatever reason I haven't had very much, are with ants. Um, ants can be a big problem. Um, you know, you can, all the feeders that I showed, you know, most of them have like a little thing at the top where you can put um, either, you can either put water in the top to, so that, you know, the ants can't get to it, or you can put, you know, sticky stuff on the, on the bar that hangs down to hold the feeders. But, um, yeah. Um, the, anyway, so yeah, bees, it's it's not a big deal. It's just kind of a minor irritation. By the way, I forgot to mention that um, a lot of feeders come with like a little chain and a hook, but um, something that I find much, much more convenient is to get a stiff bar of like, you know, rod of um, wire, um, you know, like mm -hmm. coat hanger wire kind of thing and, you know, make a hook at both ends. So then you can just hold it in one hand and pick up the feeder and hook it up there. And it's it's convenient to be able to do it with one hand instead of having to use two hands because usually you're holding another feeder in your other hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Um, and another question, our water has no chlorine, comes from a well. When cleaning the feeder, should I put a little bleach in the water and soak the feeder? Uh, yeah, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't experimented with that. Um, I would say that um, if you are feeding, if you're, you know, if you're filling your feeders, you know, once a day or more. So if they're, <clears throat> if they're going empty, you know, then it shouldn't be necessary, I would say. Um, 
yeah, you could probably read up online like <clears throat> one drop of chlorine or whatever. But um, yeah, I, 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 I would, I would just, you know, put out food, you know, put out a little bit and, you know, when it's gone, replace it, clean and sterilize the feeder. Um, you know, again, like I said before, I probably wouldn't mess with chlorine if I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. But I've never experimented with it, so I don't know. Right. Uh, okay, Yvonne wants to mention that she uses the feather friendly window tape behind the area where my feeder is. It's the only place could position the feeder, so this was the best solution, I guess, to stop uh, hummingbirds from hitting the windows. Yeah, that's that's great. Yep. Yeah. And and one thing that 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 you know not not where we're living now but uh, uh, another place where we where we lived one thing that we noticed is that we did sometimes get hummingbirds hitting the windows they were always black chinned in migration the annas who were around all the time they never hit the windows so it seemed to be a you know a uh, 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 you know the hummingbirds that weren't familiar with the area. Um, yeah. We had to move the feeders multiple times to try to get them to not, you know, having them too far away was bad. Having them too too close, you know, some somewhere in between, um, turned out to work better. Yeah, it seems like the worst spots are places where they can kind of like see in a window, and then through the house they see can see another window on the other side where that looks like they can fly all the way through. I think mm -hmm. in my house it seems like those sorts of situations are the ones that have caused the most problems. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any more questions in the Q and A? We are. We've seemed to have exhausted all the questions. Very good questions. Uh, and if not, um, thank you so much for a wonderful webinar. Uh, I'm sure everybody's going to go out and buy their ten-pound bags of sugar now, and and all the the you know better feeders and not the little little fancy ones that don't work and i'm getting seeing a bunch of thank yous in the in the chat so all right well i'm i'm uh i'm really i'm really i hope it helps people and i <clears throat> would love to see some like active feeders down along the immediate coast in la county i bet you find some really interesting things mm -hmm. yep that'd be great um yeah so so thank you very much and we'll see everybody um next week for flammulated owls all right okay all right bye everybody okay. yeah thanks bye again everyone. david great job you great you did a great job i learned so much thank you all right thank you lily for introducing me all right no bye bye